Once upon a time, there was a bang. And it was a big bang, and out of it poured all of time and space, energy and matter. But this matter was not the mix of chemicals we see today, but mostly hydrogen, with a bit of helium and just a pinch of tritium and deuterium. This gas exists in vast molecular clouds. These can be hundreds of light years across, and these are our stellar nurseries, where our, our stars will form. And they are contracting under the force of gravity. Now, different parts of these giant molecular clouds will clump together under the force of gravity, and these are our protostars. Overall, these clouds are neutrally charged, but collisions between particles will create a force acting against the contraction due to gravity. But what happens next depends very much on the mass. For small masses, these eventually reach an equilibrium and are pretty much just gas giants. But when they're contracting, they're losing gravitational potential energy. This gravitational potential energy is converted to heat. And so as our protostar contracts, it gets hotter. As they get hotter, they will emit more light, acting as black bodies. So the hotter they get, they'll both emit more intense light and light of shorter and shorter wavelengths. Above about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, they'll be producing enough radiation to be classified as a brown dwarf. Now this still isn't a star, but it is uh, emitting a lot of infrared radiation and a little bit in the visible spectrum. It's called a brown dwarf because of the low intensity of the light that it's producing and because it's very small. For more massive protostars, and we're talking here about at least 0.08 solar masses, as they contract, they, can, they reach temperatures of at least 10 million Kelvin. And this is enough energy for our protons to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between them. This is the start of nuclear fusion. At this temperature, hydrogen can fuse into helium, and finally, we have a true star. And there are a couple of different ways that stars do this. The first is the proton-proton chain, or the PP chain. In this, we have individual protons combining together to form a heavier helium nucleus, with two of the protons emitting positrons to become neutrons, leaving a more stable nucleus. The final helium nucleus produced has a lower mass than the nucleons that we started with, because it has a higher binding energy per nucleon. This means that there is energy released during each one of these fusion reactions. For every helium nucleus produced, about 25 mega electron volts are released. Our alternate path is something called the CNO cycle. We can see that although this nucleus is changing throughout this cycle, once that alpha particle, once that helium nuclei is released, we are back to the carbon that we started with. So in this case, the carbon is not used up, it's just acting as a catalyst. Now the CNO cycle becomes much more efficient at higher temperatures. Um, so for a star the size of our sun, it will not really be producing very much energy at all through the CNO cycle. It does need to be a larger star to have that increase in mass, to have that higher temperature. Now, both the PP chain and the CNO cycle all release energy. And this energy is now able to counteract that gravitational contraction and an equilibrium is reached. We've classified stars according to their brightness, their absolute magnitude, and by their colour, which tells us about their temperature. Uh, we can combine both of these classifications on something called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Hertzsprung and Russell actually came up with a very similar way of classifying it independently, uh, and the diagram was therefore named after both of them. Now, one of the things that we notice on it is that the stars are not randomly spread about. Most of them, in fact, go along this line in the middle. And this is referred to as the main sequence. It was originally classified by using this diagram. However, as our understanding of the life cycle of stars has improved, we've seen this is the hydrogen burning phase of a star. This is the main part of its lifespan. Now, the time on the main sequence is very different for different stars. Now, you might assume that the more massive a star is, the more fuel it has and the longer it will survive. But in fact, the opposite is true. The more massive a star is, the more gravitational potential energy is converted into heat. The hotter it burns, the quicker it uses its fuel and the shorter its lifespan. The very largest stars can burn themselves up in a few millions of years, whereas the smallest 
might last trillions. Many orders of magnitude longer than the lifespan of the universe so far. Eventually, there will no longer be enough hydrogen in the core to sustain nuclear reactions, and the star will end its time on the main sequence. But what happens next depends very much on the mass of our star. The very smallest stars take a vast amount of time to use up all their fuel. Without fusion to support it, the star will contract, getting hotter in the process. Because these stars are very small, they will have a low brightness, uh, but the surface temperature is very hot, so they are a sort of white colour. This leads them to be classified as white dwarfs on this area of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. For mid-sized stars, and that includes our Sun, once there is no longer enough hydrogen for fusion, that core will, con will start to contract again. And as that helium core contracts, it will get hotter and hotter. Although there is no fusion inside this helium core, that hotter temperature causes the hydrogen around the core to start fusing. And even though the core itself has been shrinking, this increase in fusion in the outer layers of the star, in fact, cause the outer layers to expand. As these stars expand, the energy is more spread out, and so the temperature decreases, and so they become more red colour. But because they're so large, they're still producing a lot of light, so they're pretty bright. So they go on this area of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and they're known as red giants. And because the helium produced in those outer layers is more dense than the hydrogen surrounding it, it will sink to the core, making the core heavier, making it contract more, and making it hotter. And now, the core is massive enough to reach a temperature where helium fusion can start. Everything else we've been talking about has been on a timescale of millions or billions of years. This happens in a matter of days. It's known as a helium flash, and leaves behind a core of mostly carbon and oxygen. Although the carbon and oxygen in that core cannot fuse, the core reaches a high enough temperature that the helium surrounding it can begin to fuse, and the hydrogen surrounding that can also fuse, and so we remain in our red giant phase. During this phase, the energy released causes intense solar winds that send matter from the star out into the surrounding system. These can end up being larger than the system itself and is known as a planetary nebula. Now these stars are not heavy enough to reach the temperatures necessary for the next stages of fusion, and so they continue to contract. Contraction is halted by a quantum effect called electron degeneracy pressure. To be compressed any further, electrons have to occupy the same quantum state, and this is forbidden by the Pauli exclusion principle. So once again, we have a small star with a high surface temperature, putting us back in our white dwarf category. Over time, they will radiate heat out into the universe, and the, that brightness will decrease more and more until eventually we reach what we call a black dwarf. As we've said, more massive stars burn at higher temperatures and have much shorter lifespans. By the time it reaches the stage where it's burning the hydrogen shell, the core is already hot enough to be burning helium. So these more massive stars will never get the helium flash that we have with lower mass stars. In the same way that our red giants became uh, larger but with a lower surface temperature, these stars are even larger. And so we refer to these as our super giants. With no fusion to support it, the core will contract, getting hotter and hotter, causing the fusion of heavier elements, until those run out. Again, with no fusion to support it, the core will start to contract, again getting hotter and hotter, causing the fusion of heavier elements, until those run out. And with no fusion to support it, the core will again contract, getting hotter and hotter, causing the fusion of heavier elements. Throughout each stage of this nuclear fusion, we've been burning heavier and heavier elements. As the heavier elements are produced, they will sink, leaving the layers, kind of like an onion, with the densest at the centre working their way out to the lightest. This has been fine so far because as we have gone up the periodic table, the binding energy per nucleon has increased, so we are getting more and more stable nuclei and releasing energy with each fusion reaction. If we remember the graph that we looked at showing the binding energy per nucleon, it reaches a peak at iron. This is the most stable nuclei, and we cannot fuse heavier elements without absorbing energy. They're essentially endothermic rather than exothermic, so they're not going to be able to balance out the gravitational forces of the star. With no fusion to balance the weight, the core will start to collapse. 
as the core collapses, the layers around it will also fall in on it, compressing more, rebounding off that core and releasing a vast amount of energy. Enormous forces and temperatures are unleashed, and here there is enough energy to form elements heavier than iron. This output of energy vastly increases the absolute magnitude of the star. For a very short time, it outputs much more energy than at any other stage of its life. A single supernova can be producing as much light as pretty much its entire galaxy it's in. In fact, if there was one in our galaxy, we would be able to see it day and night. It would be comparable to the sun. And of course, at these vast energies, we're also producing more and more of our higher frequency ionizing radiation. We get a gamma ray burst from supernovas. This vast outpouring of gamma rays is a clear sign that a supernova has happened. It's one of the things that astronomers look for. Although, of course, if one happened too close to Earth, the intensity of the gamma rays would be enough to wipe out all life on our planet. Now, after this explosion, the outer layers have been exploded off into a supernova remnant. What's left at the core can be a couple of different things depending on the mass of the star. We've seen white dwarfs supported by the electron degeneracy pressure, but these stars are much more massive. The core left behind is even more dense than a white dwarf. The gravity now is strong enough to overcome the degeneracy pressure, and the protons and electrons combine to form neutrons, leaving us with an object made almost entirely of neutrons and of a pretty similar density to a nucleus itself. This is another form of degenerate matter, with further compression resisted by neutrons obeying the Pauli exclusion principle. Now these neutron stars, we know they have a very high mass, and because they are so dense, they also have a very low radius. Now if we look at our formula for escape velocity, we can see that increasing the mass and decreasing the radius is going to lead to a very high escape velocity. Now neutron stars can have incredibly high escape velocities, maybe a half, two thirds of the speed of light. What if we could set that escape velocity to the speed of light? Now for any given mass, there is going to be a radius small enough where the escape velocity is going to be the speed of light. And this radius is known as the Schwarzschild radius. This means any mass that goes below its Schwarzschild radius is going to have an event horizon beyond which you would need to be travelling faster than the speed of light to escape. Now that's impossible, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. This is known as a black hole. But that's not the end. It's just the beginning. See, our Sun is a second generation star. It's not just made up of the hydrogen and the helium that was present at the birth of the universe, but also heavier elements that were formed in stars and supernova that came before. When supernovas explode, the heavier elements in that star are shot out into the surrounding giant molecular cloud, seeding future stars. And the shock waves that grow out cause clumps of matter, kick-starting the next generation of star formation. And those clumps contracting can have a rotational element to them. So as well as the protostar forming in the centre, it ends up with an accretion disk around it. And that disk can itself coalesce into smaller objects, the planets. We obviously have noticed that Earth is full of heavier elements that can only be made in stars and supernova, including the ones that make up us. We're all made of stardust. I'll take two